Well, um, you saved me the trouble of having to actually read the title of the lecture. It's a pretty long one. Um, and we'll get to that part on quantum physics at one stage, but this will be later on in the presentation. So it's a little trick, of course, to keep you in the room until you get to that part. So at least nobody's leaving, I think, before that. So um, let's get on with it. And of course, as we customarily do with these types of uh, lectures, is there is a purpose, objectives of this kind of uh, presentation. And um, so what we have here, well, some of the things you already said, Lida, so I'll go quickly through this, but um, it's basically having, giving you an idea about accountability. What does it actually mean? And especially in terms of um, European funded programs in development aid and uh, also structural funds, which I don't know if everybody knows about this, but this is the large amounts of money uh, turning around inside the European Union. It's very similar to development aid only inside of Europe. So many of the problems are the same and many of the methodologies and things they talk about are also exactly the same. So that's basically public sector perspective uh, that I'm coming from. Um, I'm going to situate results-based management in that discussion about accountability, especially public sector results-based management in structural funds and uh, European funded programs. To help you a little bit uh, what this actually means, I'll give you some insights on the history. Yeah. Because results-based management is something that is, it's not totally new, but let's say that it began really to take off in the 90s, but it has a long history. So it didn't come out of nowhere. And it's good to understand where it comes from. Yeah. I'll talk about something called the results chain, which is a really central concept in results-based management and in the concept of accountability that is linked to this. So results chain will be something we go uh, into. And then, well, that's the biggest part, I suppose, of the presentation is I'll really talk about the limitations of this and the danger also of, uh, of people, you know, praising this as the new holy grail. Now, this might sound strange from somebody who's actually running the European community of practice on results-based management. But uh, in the afternoon, I'll talk about something that we call results-based management plus. So that's basically the next generation, you could say, of, re of results-based management, where we're trying to deal with the limitations that are actually existing in the current philosophy in the way of working with results-based management. So that's more, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it already this, this morning, but in the afternoon, that's really when I'll offer the alternative to that and say, OK, let's move to results-based management plus. We're not there yet, I have to say, in the public sector, because uh, these ideas are relatively new. But uh, at least conceptually, I think we're, we're basically, we've worked it out what we need to do. So that's basically the boring objectives. So now uh, let's say what the real purpose is uh, for this morning. Uh, these other things apply too. But in the end, what I think I can really do for you today is bombard you with seriously provoca provocative ideas sometimes. Uh, so a lot of things you will say like, my god, what the hell is he talking about? So, um, and of course, uh, we'll be able to discuss that. The idea is to bring through, break through some mental models also, right? because uh, many of the ideas of results-based management, and that's why I do this history bit, is really very much ingrained these days in our way of thinking. Uh, and that is, to me, a little bit of a problem sometimes. If we want to move on to something more sophisticated, sometimes we need to unlearn what we have learned. So that's part of my uh, idea today. So I'm going to try, if you have this trouble with uh, a mental model that uh, I need to break, I'll try to break it today. OK. Um, what is also useful, I think, from this type of presentation is that your capacity is built to engage others on this topic, to basically uh, you know, spread the message a little bit and say there is something else than the standard uh, way of thinking about results-based management. And um, you might actually take it a little bit forward also wherever you end up or whatever position you have at the moment, this is the idea that you, uh, you know, you're better informed and you can discuss these things uh, in a better way. Now, it has to be said that nobody really has definitive answers to all the problems that we are confronted with. So I'm just giving one answer at some point or a way to think about it, but it's definitely not uh, the same as the, you know, the, the recipe that we can all follow and, or the blueprint that we can all follow and we don't have to think about it anymore. It's just listen to what the lecturer says and do it and it'll be fine. Basically, it's handing you over ideas which you'd still have to convert into practice in many cases uh, by thinking about what to do wherever you are. Okay, that's the, the stuff uh, for now. Feeling dizzy might be a slight, slight side effect, so you know, 
<laughs> that's normal. Uh, so uh, I tend to move quite fast. Um, if it's really too fast, uh, just go like this. Slow down, slow down, slow down. We're going too fast. We can't follow anymore. The idea is also we have, yes? Yes, um, because that's where basically results-based management in the sustainable development way of thinking is, you know, that's where it's happening. Uh, results-based management, I'll link it to some private sector philosophies also, but it's the public sector way of thinking about uh, performance management. Uh, so it's, it's something that in the private sector, you'll, you'll hear a lot of things which are, you know, resonate if your framework is more the private sector. But my question was about, you know, doing something about results-based management, which is a public sector framework of performance management, basically. Yeah. Okay. Um, where were we? Yes. So, oh, maybe before I start, uh, in terms of questions, the presentation really builds up. So a lot of questions that people want to ask in the beginning tend to be answered later on. So what I would uh, propose is that you write down your questions, if they're really fundamental ones, and then we treat them at the end of the presentation. Uh, otherwise, we'll probably be in trouble with the timing. However, if there is something that when you're listening to it, you say, I really didn't get that, uh, then of course you can interrupt and say, could you say again what you meant there? It wasn't clear at all, so I'll try to then clarify. So clarification questions is fine at the moment. More fundamental, real discussion questions, I'd like to keep for the end when we've seen the whole thing. Yeah, otherwise, we'll be uh, really in trouble with the time. Okay? Okay, so. Well, you have to start somewhere, so let's start with a little definition of sustainable development, one that probably you know and that has been discussed here uh, in the school. So this is one that uh, an author which I really like, Peter Senge, he's quoting, it's not his either, you know, it's been around for a while, this, this uh, um, definition. It's, uh, it's, I think, something you all know, uh, the need to live in the present in ways that do not jeopardize the future. I think that's probably a common definition of uh, sustainable development. Now, when we're in the public sector, like I usually am, um, everybody talks about sustainable development all the time. European Commission has strategies on it. Uh, you know, it's all about sustainability. But in the end, it looks like nobody really is held accountable for this. Uh, so we all use the term quite often. It's very fashionable. But in the end, accountability is not really connected that much to it. So I want to dive into that concept of accountability and then see how we can link this to sustainable development. So accountability for what? I'm going to show you a few cartoons to think about and keep in mind that reflect different ways of thinking about accountability. So have a look at this one. Is it readable for everybody also down the back? So that's one way of thinking about it. Well, what is behind this is one dimension of accountability. And this is what we call keeping things lean and purposeful. Well, of course, the uh, image was a travesty of that. <laughs> it was sort of saying uh, what could be a really bad uh, way of dealing with that. But the idea of keeping it lean and purposeful, that's what you know, a lot of people understand with accountability when they talk about um, you know, value for money. You know, how much resources are we spending to get what output? Are we getting the output that we want? Uh, that type of thing really is uh, being lean and purposeful. Yeah. So what, the, what is the worst thing that can happen is in this type of accountability is waste, you know, inefficiency. That's not what we want. Yeah. So lots of discussions about accountability are dealing with that. Now, when we look at what they focus on, it tends to be on output. So how much are we getting for our money? How much is coming out? Slack, that means you know, the overall level of inefficiency in a system tends to be quite low, of course, in this type of concept of accountability. The goals tend to be quite focused, so it tends to be a single fixed goal that everybody has to work towards. That's one way of dealing with accountability, probably one that you are familiar with, uh, have heard about in some way. Okay, this is another one.
Now that's a different type of accountability. This has to do, it relates to honesty and fairness, which is not the same thing. I hope you understand as keeping it lean and purposeful. So if you saw the previous cartoon, you had the sort of feeling that uh, the boss was being slightly arbitrary, just telling people to do something different the next day than they were doing the day before. Um, well, that has to do with this type of dimension of accountability, honesty and fairness. Right? So what is, for example, standard of fairness of, uh, of uh, failure is abuse of office, bias, that type of thing. So arbitrariness, you could say, is one of those elements also. Right? So here, um, the emphasis is basically on process. It's on how things are done. It's not on what comes out, but how they are done. In these types of systems of accountability, there tends to be more slack. Right? That's because the focus is not on efficiency, obviously. Right? So there tends to be more slack. It's not as efficient as in keeping it lean and purposeful. We also tend to have to deal with incompatible in, uh, goals. Right? For example, there might be a necessity to be very transparent. It's a very nice word, transparency. Everybody needs to know basically what the rules are, for example. But if you think about it from a program funder perspective, like I do uh, very often, well, transparency sometimes doesn't work that well with doing the best possible decision. Uh, for example, we get paper-based applications for proposals for project funding. Of course, all the rules are very transparent, but that means, of course, that um, people have to conform to that. This might not give the best picture, basically, of what they want to do. It might not be terribly fair. And you get that type of response from people saying, yeah, but you know, we just forgot to put something in the paperwork, and now we don't get funded. And then we say, yes, but you know, the rules are the rules. It's transparency. So sometimes there are conflicting objectives here. Right? Many dimensions of fairness actually you know, might be conflicting if you try to work it out in practice. So that makes things a little bit more complicated. But it's definitely a different type of accountability than what we have here. So there's a third one. It's a slightly larger cartoon. Isn't Dilbert the great fountain of wisdom? <laughs> Everybody see it? Okay. okay, so what's behind this? This is uh, accountability as keeping things robust and resilient. Right? That has to do with adaptivity. Uh, I'll talk about adaptivity a lot. Uh, this is basically an important concept in the rest of the presentation also. Right? That means, for example, we want to avoid breakdowns. We want to avoid catastrophe. So risk management is also something that really thinks about this type of accountability. Now, uh, what we see here in terms of control emphasis is that, again, we're, for, we're looking basically at process, also input, but also mainly process. So that's, again, different from the keeping it lean and purposeful paradigm of accountability. We have a lot of slack in this type of system. Why? Because basically we're keeping redundant systems alive because we are afraid that if one system breaks down, we need some backup. Uh, so it's basically a, a concept of accountability that requires a high level of inefficiency. Right. Let's look at some examples. Uh, oh, maybe also the goals here are what we call emergent goals. Right. There tend to be lots of them, but they're also emergent. That means we do not know in advance exactly what we will try to achieve. Right. I'll talk about emergence also a lot afterwards. Uh, so this is going to come back but try to remember this is tied to keeping things robust and resilient. That's basically the whole range of uh, ideas around accountability. So try to remember the cartoons. That might be easier than all of this stuff on this slide uh, when we go a little bit further. Some examples maybe, typical expressions of these different types of accountability, also applicable to the private sector, for example. Just-in-time inventory control systems. That has something to do with being lean and purposeful. Payment by results systems, that's something taking off quite heavily in the public sector today where, you know, for example, in uh, programs where you're supposed to put unemployed people into employment, you only get money when you actually achieve that. Otherwise, that's your problem. Some examples of honest and fair. 
These are the systems, demographic, democratic systems, for example, of getting uh, officials uh, out of office uh, by voting, that type of thing. Public tendering rules are there. Uh, so everybody knows that if you're working in the public sector, uh, in the government business, you can't just give contracts to anybody. You have to go through procedures, through rules in terms of public tendering. That has to do with keeping things honest and fair, uh, or has to do with let's not give any money to our friends, you know, and keep the whole family alive with uh, public money. Anti-corruption investigation bodies, that's all part of this paradigm of honesty and fairness. When we look at robust and resilient, there's some other examples here. There's redundancy, backup systems, in case things go wrong. Think about what happened in Japan, for example. Might have been a little bit too focused on this and slightly less on that. Yeah. Nuclear accident, right? Everybody knows about that. <laughs> Diversity is also important here. Yeah. So this is all the ideas of we need to have people with a very diverse background because they cancel out each other's blind, blind spots. Yeah. That type of thinking is also tied to robustness, to adaptivity. And then basically uh, using more m materials than actually is necessary is to make sure that buildings don't collapse, for example, because you're being so lean and purposeful that, well, you know, engineering-wise, it looks good on paper, but in practice, the building actually breaks down. That type of thinking is behind these different expressions uh, of accountability. Everything still clear for everybody up until now? Okay. Now, in terms of sustainable development, you also find in the discussions, you find these concepts back. Lean and purposeful, that's the typical, you know, avoid being wasteful, uh, let's recycle and that type of thing. Efficient resource utilization. And honest and fairness, we hear lots of discussions about being respectful of different cultures, of nature, empowering people. That's basically linked to that. And then in terms of robustness and resilience, it's maintaining levels of biodiversity and not extending beyond critical thresholds. That type of discussion is behind that concept. So I think that's probably familiar from your classes and discussions that you find these three different types of accountability in the discussions. It's actually quite useful to keep thinking about it like that. Which of the different types am I in? What are we discussing right now? So they're basically linked to all three types. It's not just one thing. Everybody agrees with that? Okay. Now, this is too small to read because we don't need all of it. These are the different elements of something called new public management. So in, if you're in the public sector, new public management is seen as really the way we should do things. It's new, it's not really that new anymore. It's already old, but it's still considered to be the things that everybody should do to improve the public sector. Now let me just focus on two parts of that, which are very key in this idea of new public sector management. Um, and it's two parts which have to do, or basically, which are showing that new public sector management is, is, uh, is linked to the paradigm of keeping it lean and purposeful, and not to the other ones. So if you look closely at new public management, it doesn't really link to the other two types of accountability. It links itself predominantly, focuses really on keeping things lean and purposeful. You'll hear me building up that this is basically a flaw built into this type of thinking. Yeah? If we are linking different types of thinking about accountability to sustainable development, but the dominant management paradigm out there in terms of how to run the public sector is based on just one dimension of accountability, this is going to create problems in terms of sustainable development. So two key parts that I'll zoom into into uh, a little bit during the rest of the presentation are basically that you need to have these explicit standards and measures of performance. That's really important. That's why I said, basically, to responding to your question, that uh, results-based management is all about performance management in, in essence. Eh? Results-based management plus goes a little bit further. Eh? But basically, the basic idea is, uh, is a performance management framework. So we're putting a lot of emphasis also here on output controls. This is a move away from what was used, used to be uh, the case in the public sector, where people were actually much more interested in process before. So 
That, if you think about what I just said, the process perspective is linked more to the other two types of accountability. So what's happened with new public management is there has been a shift away from that towards really saying, basically, keep it lean and purposeful. That's what we want, and that's the only thing that matters. Of course, all these other perspectives are still lingering around. Eh? We haven't gotten rid of public tendering rules, for example, in the public sector, although some people say we should because they think this is enough. We just need to focus on keeping things lean and purposeful, and that will basically be the best way of managing the public sector and hence also managing programs like structural funds and development aid. So that's really behind public management. Eh? The other elements are also there, but less important for the discussion that we'll have later on. Okay, so what's happened now, in mainly in development aid and in structural funds, is that results-based management is the emanation of new public management in development aid. So nobody calls things new public management. What people call it is results-based management. But it's basically the same thing. It's just a way to make all these disparate principles, uh, the seven that I showed on the earlier slides where I zoomed in on two, it's just a way to translate that into another system that is not totally clear. I'll talk about that later on. Yeah. But it's definitely, let's say, closely linked to each other. Results-based management really is just uh, new public management made specific. Now, this is a quote from a report very recent published in December 2011. So that's really recent, where uh, it basically is saying how this agenda of effectiveness and results really has been coming to the front of the stage uh, lately. So this is really Every f the thing that everybody is talking about. Eh? There was a high-level conference, and high-level really means high-level, with ministers and you know half uh, their cabinets uh, attending in uh, Busan, which was also very recent, November, December. I've been involved in some of the preparation for that as well, and there really you know this was all about results, results. We need to get more results out of uh, public uh, money. So especially in the context of development aid, and you know uh, in that sense linked also to sustainable development. But it's easy to say that, of course, everybody holds this as the new paradigm. So we all should do that, focus on that. It has lots of consequences, and you can really question whether this is going to be the way to get more sustainable development. So let's question that by moving a little bit on. A definition from results-based management, because we haven't really defined it yet. I've just said it's an emanation of new public management. Um, but basically, it's been around since the early 90s. So, and Canada is one of those countries that has been really a proponent of that. There are others that are always named, um, basically also those that are very big on new public management in their other sectors, eh? because results-based management is development aid mainly. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, like Canada, new public management has been a big thing there. Now, they uh, call it a management strategy aimed at achieving important changes in the way organizations operate. That's important. It's at the level of organizations, not projects or programs, with improving performance, of course, in terms of results as the central orientation. It's a management framework with tools for strategic planning, risk management, performance monitoring, and evaluation. Its primary purpose, hope this rings a bell now in terms of accountability, is to improve efficiency and effectiveness through organizational learning, and secondly, to fulfill accountability obligations through performance reporting. This pretty much sums up uh, the idea. So this is a more recent definition, but originally the Canadians invented the term, basically, uh, and came up with it in a development aid context. So I hope you see that this is really linked quite closely to lean and purposeful concept of accountability. You don't really see much there that has to do with any of the other concepts. Uh, it's very much oriented towards that, which is normal because basically it originated out of no, no public management, which itself is completely oriented towards lean and purposeful uh, thinking about accountability. Now, just a little bit of history to tell you how this thing came about, because uh, it, it was coined as a term in the 90s where they really institutionalized it but it's been coming for a long time. And uh, one of the origins, and there are many origins, it's a child with many parents, uh, one of the origins is management by objectives, which probably people working more in uh, the private sector uh, know about, which is a philosophy that was launched by Peter Drucker, a famous uh, management guru. 
in a book called The Practice of Management way back in 1954. So saying that it's a new thing is probably uh, exaggerated. Now, with Peter Drucker, what he actually emphasized, and you saw the word coming back in the definition earlier, is he emphasized the fact that we need to learn. He discouraged the use of mechanical models, you know, scientific management. He said, well, this is not what we need to do, formula-based management. We have indicators and, you know, or, or targets, and following the targets, if you don't meet them, then automatically you get punished. That type of thing was something that Drucker did not actually approve of. Right? So he said we need to be more intelligent about how we do our business or how we manage. We can use information for that, but what's important is to learn. Okay. Adaptation was also very important. So empowerment of employees so they could adapt, adapt to the ever-changing circumstances. He was very early thinking about that because in the 50s, you know, things were slightly more stable <laughs> than they are now. So now everything is moving much faster. The environment is changing much quicker. Uh, but in the 50s, Drucker was already saying, well, you know, stuff changes and we need to basically adapt to that. You need to take into account that things are changing. So he's using information and learning for that to basically empower people to make sure that they can adapt and don't stay stuck in the same old routines and basically kill the company. Um, and that was really what he found more important than control and predictability. Uh, I'm deliberately using these things because Mechanical models, control and predictability, is definitely what results-based management is focusing on now. So it moved away from the original philosophy at some point. Now, at the moment, in the private sector, management direct is really the, cur the current, let's say, state-of-the-art format of that is the balanced scorecard thinking as developed by uh, Kaplan and Norton. So people from the private sector probably know uh, about that. Uh, so about what's there called the execution premium process now. They sort of branded it a little bit more sexy than just balanced scorecards, but essentially that's what it's all about. It's a balanced scorecard methodology. That's a, a real uh, inheritance of, uh, of Drucker's management by objectives. It's not the only parent, so we had Drucker, but then we also had something coming in in 1969 in the uh, uh, United States uh, development aid, which is called the logical framework approach. Who knows about the logical framework approach? Some people know about it, yeah. So in development aid, this is the dominant uh, way of uh, dealing with uh, project prep planning, basically. It's trying to figure out uh, what the objectives should be and uh, which activ activities we should do for that. So the logical framework approach got developed uh, into something called GOP, OP and PCM, right? goal-oriented project planning, objectives-oriented project planning, and project cycle management. Right? These are the tools, basically, that are now in use in most of the major development funding agencies, right? like the United Nations and European Commission, and so on. Right? So that's basically the, the way to do it. It's not the only parent. There's a little bit more parents, you know. It's a very active uh, society at that moment. So we had uh, in the 60s also something that was called the planning, programming, and budgeting systems approach, right? where basically the emphasis was much more on the activity side. This is where all the Gantt charts uh, in project planning and all the network analysis and that type of stuff comes from, uh, trying to figure out what is the optimal path of implementation and planning everything in details with milestones. You know, most of the major uh, software packages that deal with project planning, that's that approach, uh, where they then try to look for optimal paths. That's very much against the idea of thinking in Drucker's management by objectives. It's another approach. Management by objectives was trying to get people to focus on outcomes, to focus on achieving something, less on you know, frantically, obsessively managing all the details and trying to figure out the best possible path to actually get there. Still not finished. We had another wave of uh, approaches at some point that actually tried to combine the more Drucker and uh, logical framework approaches with the more planning approaches that we've had in program uh, in PPBS, as people know it, planning, programming, and budgeting systems. That really didn't take off. This is where we find lots of uh, literature on performance-based budgeting approaches. Uh, so that is something that you know, World Bank wrote about it, IMF wrote about it, uh, most uh, Big uh, donors uh, wrote about it, Asian Development Bank wrote about it. 
but it's not something that really is used much. I mean, something uh, at the OECD is a network of senior budgeting officials, and that network is basically about that. And uh, it's always fun, they have uh, yearly presentations, and uh, at the end of the presentations, the one conclusion I always have is, is nobody does that. They're pretending to do that in some way, but essentially they're doing bits and pieces of the other approaches. Eh? Nobody's really managed to integrate all of that into this ideal where people also think they can actually cost outcomes. That means we basically know or would know how much it should cost to get somebody into a job. That's costing a result, saying how much is it worth to get somebody into a job. That's not really done anywhere, almost not done anywhere. Okay, then we have at the end of the story, finally the new public management philosophy coming in, which is really a philosophy. Eh? It's a previous slide where I had these seven items where we zoomed in on two only. Eh? That is basically a philosophy. It's not really an integrated approach with lots of tools, it's principles. Now that came in in the 80s and in the end RBM uh, built on all of these previous phases and situated itself firmly into the new public management philosophy. Okay, that's the history of results-based management. So now you know when you see some sources and some titles flying around where to put it, where to situate this. Huh? All of that gets subsumed this day, these days under the heading of results-based management. So all of these things might actually find their way in some form or another in the discussion about results-based management. So people have been really good at recuperating all of these concepts and uh, making them come alive again under the banner of results-based management. But then, you know, you understand just by looking at the history of that, this is not somebody thinking up some coherent uh, approach with uh, specific tools. This is basically something that came about quite organically and based itself on a number of developments that happened earlier. This also means that basically there is no singular model for results-based management. It's a term like new public management that is basically just denoting a number of principles. And you know, it depends on the consultant, uh, for example, uh, which of these other things they're actually putting under that banner. But what is common across all of these uh, different uh, things uh, which are put under the banner of results-based management is a few principles. First one is there has to be an analytical and performance-oriented approach. That's one thing. Second thing is, is a center, is a focus on beneficiary-level development. That means uh, citizens that you actually try to improve their lives, their well-being, that you do something for. Huh? That's the focus. Only then, once you've had that focus, you move towards how should we do it? What resources should we actually deploy? Huh? So this is what is called a, f a shift from output thinking, which is the lean and purposeful way of thinking about accountability, towards outcomes. You did not see uh, outcome-based thinking in any of the three different uh, types of accountability. You saw output-based thinking there. And honestly, to be honest, this is just the same thing. Yeah? Now people say, well, outcomes are dominating, but in the end, we only need outcomes to determine the outputs. That's basically what's happening. Yeah? So it's not standing really on its own. It's still connected very much to lean and purposeful way of thinking. Then we generate information. We're supposed to learn from that. That's one of the things that doesn't happen. Generating information happens a lot. Learning from it, oof, that seems to be more in, in, uh, difficult. Influencing decisions based on this information and learning, that's the other aspect that is uh, crucial to results-based management. That doesn't happen a lot either. Might have to do with the fact that we don't learn, but uh, even just pure information doesn't tend to really influence the decisions. So that's interesting to note, uh, that these are the key concepts behind it, but in practice, let's say at least these two are tending to be a problem. It's not really happening the way people had expected it to happen. Now, a lot of tools that I talked about earlier, uh, the uh, logical framework approach, PCM, that type of thing, the planning budgeting systems, were all intervention level tools. Uh, they were tools towards planning, formulating, managing projects or programs. What's different with results-based management is that it draws on the ideas of Drucker to put it back at the organizational level and say this is a way to manage an entire organization that may have many different programs and projects that may do things that even do not qualify as projects or 
programs, but uh, just you know whatever they do. Um, so it's putting it back at the level of the organization. So that, that does re represent a shift from things like the logical framework approach and, and PCM. So that's important. Yeah, this is going back to Drucker's ideas. Uh, in speak, <laughs> it's also going back to Drucker's ideas. You probably, you know, catch that from learning is important. Adapting, taking into account that learning, that's also important. That was also part of Drucker's framework. That's in speech that this is considered important. Okay, to better understand how this works in practice, because these are just principles, it's a philosophy, we have to look at something called the logic model, which is a central concept, a central tool that most people that work on results-based management use in some way or another. This is a logic model. It's not very sexy. <laughs> it's a pretty simple idea. You basically have some resources, some inputs, you put them into activities, that generates outputs, that generates outcomes, and then we have some impact which are uh, longer term out, uh, outcomes which may be for a broader population than people participating in something. Yeah? So until this part, it's all about participants. Yeah? Let's give an example to show how this works. A simple one. So we might have some vaccination project going on in some developing country. Some people get vaccinated, they are participants. What happens less after that, hopefully, is that they get less infections, right? That's what we hope. Why would the others vaccinate them? Then uh, a broader, higher level impact is something like people die less from infec infections, not just participants, but also you know, other people that might get the infections otherwise from people that get infected. Yeah? So that's the idea of results chain. It's a very simple idea. You know, where in private sector people use that type of thing as well. Uh, it's basically flow charts and, and things like that. This is a very central idea in uh, results-based management. It's called the hierarchy of objectives. If you know a little bit what the logical framework approach looks like, this is the first column in the logical framework matrix. Now, that's basically a model used to strengthen the idea of accountability in the lean and purposeful sense of the word. word. Uh, so it's really about that. So it's about outputs. For example, children or participants that we vaccinate, this is an output, how many kids have received vaccinations. That's assumed to be under direct control. Uh, so this is an important idea of accountability, is that you have control over the outputs. So that means if you mess up there and you're not vaccinating the amount of kids you're supposed to vaccinate, somebody will get really angry and say, well, you know, why not? You're not doing your job. This is supposed to be under your control. So why are you not vaccinating the people you are supposed to vaccinate? This then switches in the logic model to outcomes, where that is not something under complete control. Even if you vaccinate kids, some of them might still get sick. And that's because vaccination is not foolproof. It depends a little bit on the situation. For example, we know, I dragged this off to the, of the CDC website, that's the Center for Disease Control in the United States. So I wasn't sure about this. <laughs> I had to make sure that this is something which is definitely not directly under control. And there indeed, they say, well, you know, it doesn't work as well for everybody. Some people get sick anyway. And especially, for example, older people. If you vaccinate older people, well, they tend to get sick uh, more often anyway. So it depends. That's a Basically, a question of a condition there. It's not without condition. I'll get back to that idea of conditionality at some point in these logic models. Now, the accountability questions here are simple. It's basically, was the implementation, delivering the outputs, faithful to what was planned? Basically, did you do it the way you're supposed to do? So there's a procedure, how to vaccinate people, and you don't do it differently because we've established what the best ways of delivering the vaccine. That's one thing. Then the other accountability question is, and did it produce an effect? So basically, are, you know, are participants getting less sick? If it doesn't produce an effect, it's not considered, of course, to be very lean and purposeful. It's a waste. Then another question is, that's great. Can we do it cheaper? Those are the three basic account accountability questions within the results-based management framework 
attached to the lean and purposeful sense of accountability, which is the only concept of accountability that is at work in result-based management and in new public management connected to that. Everybody still keeping track of all this <laughs> stuff? Okay. Now, how do people deal with accountability here? Because it's easy to say that you know, it should produce an effect. Huh? If we give people vaccines, we expect uh, less people to get sick from infections, right? attract, contract less infections. Well, the question is, of course, if we just measure before we give people vaccines and after we give, we've given them vaccines, if people get less sick, is this what we have as an effect? Does anybody know about this? We call that a treatment in the jargon of evaluation. Uh, we say, well, there has been a treatment, a vaccine was given. We see an effect. Let's say that people uh, uh, basically, um, you know, this is the level of starting, and then it improves. Uh, less people get sick, that's the level where we end up. Is that the effect? So that means from here to here, this part, is that the magnitude of the effect? Anybody familiar with this type of discussion? Who thinks it's the magnitude of the effect? Who thinks it's not the magnitude of the effect? <laughs> Who doesn't know? <laughs> okay. It's not the magnitude of the effect, basically. That's too easy. What we actually need is we need a control group. We need to have people that do not get vaccines because, of course, not all these people get sick anyway also. So it's about the incremental effect. So what we watch is at the end, we want to see, did the people in the treatment group get less sick than the people in the control group? Because the entire effect is not due to the treatment. So it's an incremental effect. Now, this is a really important concept in terms of the lean and purposeful discussion around accountability. This is why, for example, the World Bank, European Commission are putting a lot of emphasis around something called randomized control trials. This is basically the simple model of a randomized control trial. It's coming from medicine. That's why vaccination is an interesting example for this. This is how they basically try to figure out if you know, new medicine is a good idea or not, works or doesn't work. Now, a lot of emphasis is, in is being put on that in, t in evaluation. And it's sort of becoming, let's say, the new uh, truth and uh, should not be questioned anymore. I was uh, very recently at the UK Evaluation Society conference where the government, the UK government, had just issued the new guidance in terms of evaluation of public policy and programs. And the only thing that was still in that guidance was this. Everything else, all the other ways of doing it, had been erased. And then uh, it was very funny the way they communicated about that and said, yeah, this is, you know, everybody needs to do this or some form of that because there are varieties. And in practice, some of these things are hard to do and people came up with lots of different methodologies to actually get close to this. And then they said, yeah, and all the other stuff, you know, like case study research and all that qualitative stuff, you can still do that, but basically it's for the people who are too stupid to do this. That's what they said. Okay. So that was a clear message. The same thing is happening at the level of the European Commission. So again, this is being promoted as the gold standard, golden standard. This is the best way to determine effects. Now let's have a little fun with that statement and see if that's true. And this should destroy your faith in the wisdom of public uh, uh, organizations and large multilateral don donors. So let's have this example to think about what does that really mean, randomized control trials. Let's have a, a, a fun exercise here. Let's assume that we've got 200 plants in pots, and we then randomly assign these two pots, groups of pots, 100 plants we put uh, in one group, and 100 plants we put in another group. They're equal in all respects, because we've randomly allocated them. So you know, if there are any differences between the plants, because of the random allocation and because of the law of law, large numbers, we're working with sizable amounts here, you can say that on average the two groups will be equal. So no differences between the two groups. That's important in randomized controlled trials. There should be no difference between the two groups. 
Because the only difference that we want to have is the one that we actually install, the one that we implement. Now here, that would be giving water to these 100 plants and not giving water to these. Because that's what we're thinking. We have a theory that if you give water to plants, they will grow. That's, you know, probably a sound theory, you would say. Well, this randomized control trial is going to say it, it doesn't work. You should not give water to plants. Because what we do then is we put both groups into darkness, no light. Then we water them, this group, but we don't water that group. So what do you think the effect is in the both groups? Is they're all dead. So it doesn't matter. What, this, what randomized control trial people then say is, stop watering the plants. It's inefficient. Isn't that funny? <laughs> I find that really funny, especially because big organizations like the World Bank, United Nations, European Commission are advocating this as the only way of checking out if something works. And this simple story tells you it isn't. Why not? Because obviously water is not a sufficient condition. It's a necessary condition, but not sufficient. Now, that's a problem. So blind faith in randomized control trials basically ignores this fact that this only works if we have an intervention and a context that establishes not only one necessary condition, but all of them making the conditions together sufficient. If that is an assumption that is violated, you should not do randomized control trials. So government agencies and uh, departments and ministries saying that this is the only way to look at things, well, that is a really big mistake. Now, let's have another example to hammer this home and see also how we can start dealing with that. Huh? Because, of course, you know, smarter people than me have thought about how to solve these problems. Let's again go for two equivalent groups. It's a development aid uh, situation now, so more realistic than working with plants and flowers. It's about uh, stopping diarrhea. Uh, so, you know, in developing countries, diarrhea can be a really life-threatening situation. So uh, this is a diarrhea prevention program. And uh, part of this program is to basically train people on unsanitary practices, like, you know, you have to wash your ha hands after you've gone to the toilet, that type of thing. Because, of course, then you'll get less infections from all sorts of dirty stuff that we don't want to go into detailing. It's a pretty, pretty, pretty dirty example. Here. Okay, so the other group doesn't get any training on this, doesn't get any information. So we're assuming that this other group is going to do as they did before. Okay? It's to find out the incremental effect, obviously. Yeah? Because some of these people in the other group are washing their hands, of course, already. Yeah? They didn't have to learn about this anymore. So it's not like just uh, looking at one group is enough. So it's about the incremental effect. Now, what does this study show? Perfectly done, randomized control tire uh, trial. You know, basically no effect. You know, one group and the other group, they still have same problems. Should we stop the project? Who thinks we should stop the project? Like with the flowers. <laughs> Probably everybody guesses it's not the idea, but let's say we know we don't want to stop the project. Why not? Anybody? Why would it maybe not be a good idea? Me to tell you? Yeah, yep. Yes. No, because it's randomly selected and then randomly allocated. So the randomness, this is also an assumption, of course, but uh, you can check these assumptions, but the randomness basically makes sure that both groups are equal. So when they start it, if nobody washes their hands in the population, nobody washes their hands. But if some people do, there'll be as many of them in one group as the other. So they're equal in all respects. Uh, that's the primary assumption. The reason why we do that, uh, why we install these types of groups. So the only difference that is actually there is some people get training on unsanitary practices. Uh, that's the only difference. Everything else stays is the same as the idea. Uh, so it's not, uh, that's not the reason. Well, the reason is, again, 
basically, it's only one necessary condition. It's not sufficient. If you think about everything else that needs to be addressed before we can improve diarrheal disease, well, you, for example, also need to deal with contaminated water. You also need some improved health policies. The unsanitary practices are dealt with here by the project, but if these things are not dealt with, well, it might not actually amount to much. Now, this is a major disaster, of course, for the people that adhere to the lean and purposeful way of thinking, because to them, it's a zero effect intervention, so it's a pure waste of money. Now, of course, you could say, well, maybe it would be better to actually put some money in that as well. That's a different way of thinking about it. But it's not the ruling way of thinking about it. The ruling way of thinking about it is to say, okay, let's just stop this, because people do not look at this in randomized control trials. They do not think about it. They only look at this to that. Does it work or not? Uh, so, uh, sorry, this to this. Uh, does that actually have an effect or not? Uh, and that's it. This is a problem in, uh, in randomized control trials. Also, the way that it works by having these two equal groups, this is what we call decontextualization. Because it might well be that, like with the vaccines, if you just randomize a population that gets vaccines, there'll be an equal number of old people in one group and an equal number of old people in the other group. In the averages, in the average incremental difference, this is drowned out. You do not know this. So the fact that some things work better for some people than for other people is something that is actually drowned out in randomized control trials. There are ways to fix this. But then you have to want to do this and think about it, which usually is not the practice uh, at all. So, so those are problems we have. Eh? Whether it's working with old people or young people in vaccines and the difference between those two, that's also a condition. So this is also a question of thinking about what are the conditions in place. That's all context, basically. Is this context element present? Are people young or old? These are conditions that determine whether there will be an effect or not. Uh, so there, that has to be taken into account. And that's something that doesn't happen automatically with randomized control trials. So what we say these days is that the issue when dealing with something like that, which is a complicated world, is not attribution but contribution. That means you know, you're doing a project. These are going to be assumptions, things that you hope are there, and if they're not, you should check it and try to have something to do about that as well. But in the end, you can only contribute. This line of thinking, if this is the only thing we do, we might contribute to that, uh, logically speaking also, but it's not something that we can separate out from the other conditions. So that's a contribution logic uh, that we're having. And the way people deal with that is with case study research, mixed methods also, combining quantitative and qualitative research. Um, because randomized control trial on its own cannot tell you anything about what's happening in the context. Are there other factors that are limiting the effectiveness or not? Does it matter that people are younger or older? You know, these are things that have to be researched as well and demonstrated, substantiated with evidence, and it's not something that experimental designs, randomized control trials, can do on their own. So this calls for mixed methods research. So I hope you understand now that the call from organizations like the UK government and the European Commission that the only thing we should be doing is randomized control trials is a little bit problematic. It has a big assumption behind it that whatever intervention we are doing is basically taking care of all the necessary and sufficient conditions. Well, that's really not reality. Huh? They tend not to be like that. Huh? They tend to focus on only on a small part of what is necessary. Okay, so oh, something went wrong with the animation there. <laughs> Disregard that one. That's not supposed to be there. Well, behind this debate is uh, something that we're going to move into next. And that's the debate about uh, is reality simple, complicated, or complex? Simple issues, like the vaccine story, that's basically a clear, lineal, linear, and uh, singular dynamic. That means we give people vaccines, they get the flu, they get less flu, and people will die less from the flu. That's a quite clear, linear 
chain of evidence basically supporting that. There's not much else necessary. I mean, you've got the vaccine in your body. It's not like you need policies and all sorts of 10,000 other conditions in place to get less flu. If the vaccine is administrated properly, which is under control, then this chain of events normally materializes. We know it makes a difference for older and younger people. Uh, that's the only part that uh, also needs to be incorporated here, but there are no other conditions. So it works also for younger and older people, just a little bit less for older people. But there are no other contextual conditions. So depicting a logic model like this is actually appropriate. Doing an RCT on this is appropriate, given a slight modification that we need to take into account the nature of the people that are receiving the treatment. That's something that is not hard to do also with randomized control trials. So attribution as an accountability model actually works pretty well there. So don't mistake me by thinking that I'm against randomized control trials. I'm not. I mean, I teach research met methods at uh, business school, so I teach this stuff. And it's good stuff, but for this. When you have a chain of events, uh, cause-effect chain, that actually looks like this, where there are no, nobody can come up with other conditions that are necessary. In reality, of course, we have other types of chains. We have what we call more complicated issues. This is a, an example that is bigger on the next slide, so I'll just not explain it here, but you see it's more complicated, right? <laughs> and this is again a cause-effect chain. It's not a simple linear one like this. You've got lots of stuff happening and interacting with each other at some point. That is called a theory of change model. Now, so that can be something where there are multiple cause-effect strands, multiple paths that may all be necessary, or some of these paths might be more important or less important. We actually don't always know that. So we're, it might be even that some of these parts might not be necessary at all. This one is a little bit bigger. So I hope that's readable down there. Is that doable? No. Let me just say what's here. So this is a translation of a logical framework way of depicting that. This comes out of the a famous World Bank uh, publication uh, by another famous guy called Ray Rist in the development aid world. This is a, a star. So uh, this is the, the publication basically telling people how to do monitoring and evaluation in development aid. It's a standard publication that everybody is supposed to follow. Now, what you see here is the standard logic model again, like I showed earlier. The sort of outputs, outcome, impact, goal. Sometimes people change the, the, the terminology. What we have here, this is just activities, but what we have here is we've got media campaigns completed. We've got 100 media campaigns, campaigns towards mothers. It's about diarrhea again. It's not my fault that this is such a hot topic. <laughs> There's 100 health professionals trained in, in oral rehydration therapy, which is one of the ways of treating the effects of diarrhea. Mothers have received knowledge about oral rehydration therapy, and there is increased access to oral rehydration therapy. This is supposed to lead to improved use of oral rehydration therapy for managing childhood diarrhea, and that reduces mortality rates for children under five years old. That's a standard World Bank uh, example, which honestly, I found very confusing. This is the example everybody's supposed to follow. This is one way I mapped it out. I've got uh, three, four others. To me, the chain of causality, how they suppose this is supposed to work, I cannot clearly get that out of this type of depiction, uh, where people put something in boxes together and say, yeah, these are our outputs, and you know, outcomes will come, and then impact or goals will be achieved. Uh, it does not tell me enough. It's clearly more complicated than the vaccine example. There's more stuff going on here. There are multiple pathways towards improving diarrhea, which funnily enough is not an objective here on its own. It basically has here improved use of ORT, sort of hidden behind it. So this is a superior way of depicting the causality because it clarifies how you think the cause and effect chain actually works. So this is very close to the example I gave earlier where we're looking for 
necessary conditions, all the things we're supposed to do. The thing that's not here is, are there any other assumptions we have, and how do they link into this uh, cause-effect chain? I've just limited myself to what's here on the example. If there are assumptions, we can also link them and say, where do the assumptions come in? At which point would a chain, would, a, uh, would an effect not materialize? Because there might be another cause, a condition, an assumption that is not fulfilled. That helps us visualize and think much more clearly about the cause and effect consequence chains that we are assuming. Here, that's not enough. This is good for simple things like vaccines. It's not good enough for more complicated things. There we need to be slightly more sophisticated. It's not a leapfrog in terms of sophistication, but this is already, when you talk about this with some uh, officials, uh, European Commission and so on, <gasps> No, no, the logical framework. Why? Because it keeps things simple. You know, you think that really high paid officials are capable of handling something more complicated. This is what they usually want. That's another type of project. So, you have your output visits of teachers to parents. This is an education project. What happens then is better study results for the students. What happens then is they get a better start in the labor market. That's the type of things that usually donors, funders like to see. So yeah, that makes sense. Makes sense, right? This is what I say about that. So this is what I call, and then a miracle occurs. It makes sense, but it makes sense on the face of it. If you're a critical person, your first question should be, how the hell is that supposed to work? This is what it really looks like. That's how people assume this is going to work. So that's the simple depiction, logical framework, I think World Bank wants, Commission wants. That's the slightly more complicated depiction, showing basically that we are assuming quite a few causal strands, different pathways of actually achieving that better start in the labor market here, down here. So lots of stuff has to happen. We're assuming this is all going to happen. This is not made clear by this. That's fine. Vaccines, people get less infections and people die less. Yeah. But for something like that, to depict something like this, like that, that's a really bad idea. It will also make it easy for people to say, let's randomize this. Let's do a randomized control trial. Because, you know, it's simple, right? We just have students that don't get visits, where their parents don't get visits, and we have students where their parents do get visits. Okay. What about assumptions coming in? That's not even here. This scheme doesn't even have the assumptions again. So is that enough? Now, the way we find out when we do something called contribution analysis, so that's the other thing, Remember I talked about attribution, it's randomized control trials. Contribution, that's about, well, you know, is it enough? Is it just a contribution or is it sufficient? Is we try to figure out where the causal logic ends. So it might be that, yes, when parents and teachers get together, the teacher understands the situation at home. We can actually find this out. We can measure this even. We can measure that qualitatively or quantitatively, uh, mixed methods. But after that, empathy that you expect them to have with the students might not actually occur. Then the question will be, why not? Is there another assumption that we are missing, something we have not worked on, or is this causal logic just flawed? It just doesn't work. Insight in the situation at home just doesn't create empathy. It's not the way to do it. So these are the questions that we ask when we do contribution analysis. That's a different way of thinking. Okay. Everybody still with me? Yes? Yes? Yes. And the yep. public sector sustainable projects maybe 
the yes. The yep. If we go a little bit back in the presentation, maybe I didn't make that so much clear. I'm actually assuming implementation was done correctly. Uh, so the thing we're dealing with now is did we have an effect? Uh, so of course, we're assuming that whatever was executed was done properly. Uh, that's an assumption again. Uh, so uh, when you do evaluation for contribution or attribution, somebody should also check, of course, before you start to do all sorts of very sophisticated and complicated ways of trying to check whether there is something to attribute or to contribute, whether actually they did something in the first place. Huh? That's also, uh, uh, and whether they did it in the way that it was supposed to be done. Huh? And whether the deviations from what's supposed to be done are critical enough to say, okay, this is not, we, we cannot judge this anymore huh? because it's not the thing we try to judge, okay? Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, a few years ago, yeah. we had a campaign mm. where there was no flu. Yeah. And it worked accidentally. Uh, yeah, so exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So funding yeah. should be the, the recast of yeah. the results. Yeah. That's even worse. It's not the implementation that went wrong. It's somebody installed a program or a policy where there is no reason. So it's not even implementation failure because they maybe properly vaccinated everybody, but there was no cause to do so. That's, that's even different. Huh? So, but let's assume that there is a cause and that people should get vaccinated. Then the question is, of course, did they get vaccinated properly or was there somebody uh, you know, saying, oh, yeah, you know, Oh yeah, I have to vaccinate you, right. Uh, how do I do that again? Uh, does it have to be so many milligrams or milliliters or whatever? I don't know, I'll just do whatever. Okay, here you are. That would be poor implementation. With simple things, it's easy to check implementation, to control implementation. With complicated stuff, it's already a bit more complicated. Eh? But basically, this is something we have to, when we evaluate effects, we have to know whether the uh, implementation was faithful. That's the first question. Do not evaluate something when you already know implementation was, was, was not correctly done. Then, you know, basically, you cannot tell anything about the program you're intended, intending to evaluate. So all this story is all about effects. Eh? It's all assuming the intervention was properly conducted, which in reality is also uh, not so easy, of course. Okay, where was I? Mm, yes. So uh, this is the difference between contribution analysis and attribution analysis is we try to figure out where the cha causal chain of events, the causal logic might break down and why this is the case. It's either because the logic is just flawed or it's because there are other assumptions that we did not take into account. And it's mixed methods that are the best tool in terms of research to actually find out. Not randomized controlled trials on their own. You can mix them in mixed methods, but not on their own. Okay, that's all great. Let's make it even worse and say, okay, not only is there these days, you know, this blind belief in randomized control trials as the best way to find out if something works, but as I said repeatedly, this is also limited to the paradigm of lean and purposeful. It does not even take into account at all these other dimensions of keeping things honest and fair and robust and resilient. Neither does Contribution analysis. Uh, so attribution analysis, contribution analysis are both part of the paradigm of keeping le things lean and purposeful. Nobody looks at these other things there. So the question is, if we do this type of evaluation, which is, you know, people like me also make money with that, of course. Uh, it's a business. But are we really holding ourselves accountable for sustainable development? Probably not. Or not enough just on a limited part of it because we saw earlier that it's linked to the three items of accountability, not just to being lean and purposeful. Now I could stop here and say, okay, you know, RCTs, and I have to watch my time, <laughs> RCTs versus theory-based evaluation, which is uh, contribution analysis, that's the uh, evaluation name for it, uh, is basically, this is, you know, a battle at the moment anyway. 
Uh, so this is already, you could say, lots of people stop here and say this is the current state of affairs. Right? But um, I want to question this paradigm that lean and purposefulness as the focus of accountability is enough. Right? I don't think this is enough. I think that we need to address more things. Now, I like this quote from Peter Senge again, who's saying, well, results-based management has been around since the 90s, and still it's not really being helpful to improve uh, this type of issue. How did we get to the point that we are running out of resources, such as oil, that support our way of life, and others, such as clean air and fresh drinking water, that support life itself? So basically, we're still messing things up big time. We're probably doing it lean and purposefully, but... <laughs> Now, for that, you have to know I have uh, several degrees at university, one of them being philosophy and history. <laughs> well, two, one in philosophy, one in history. Next to being an economist and a political scientist, I have some other stuff that I did uh, in my academic uh, years. So this is coming out of that. So we have to go back a little bit further. So now we're stepping way back from uh, the story. And we're going back to the Middle Ages. Isn't that interesting? Back to the history class, where in the Middle Ages you have to understand that the Catholic Church in Europe was almighty. Okay? It basically said what truth was both in the spiritual world and the material world, the physical world. Actually, the distinction did not exist. No distinction was made between the two. That was not just like that in Europe, it was like that everywhere. Right? So right, basically what people called the world, uh, this was the, the idea of the enchanted world. Uh, the world was magical, mysterious, you know, gods living everywhere, or the god designing everything, uh, being everywhere. That's the idea of the Middle Ages. Uh. Now, what happened at some point, everybody knows Copernicus, I suppose. Uh, it's not by accident that people talk about Copernican revolutions as being really big turns of events. Well, he was the first to challenge, basically, the truths that the church proclaimed. And what he said is, well, you know, the sun doesn't revolve around the earth, it's the other way around. <laughs> that was basically seen as a major threat by the church. That mathematics and observation were being used to come up with something like that. Now, uh, the scientists did not want to get killed. So they thought, oh, we have to make sure that we can do science anyway, but without getting killed. So they said, yes, yes, but matters of the spirit and of, of people in society, that's not the realm of science. We're just looking at inanimate, inanimate dead stuff, physics, basically, yeah, the physical, the material side of reality. That shouldn't be a problem, right? That's not, you know, very sacrilegious. Okay, so they managed to, no, not get killed that way. Now, what happened a bit later on is this was the origin of a gap, of an increasing gap where the spirit and material, the material world got divided more and more. So remember, this was not the mindset. So because the scientists were working on material science and, you know, the church and churches by that time, I suppose, were working on the spiritual side, at some point the philosophers got into it and said, well, yeah, but, you know, it's different stuff, isn't it? So they have nothing to do with each other. That's Descartes. I think, therefore, I am. So Descartes said, spirit and matter is totally alien from each other. They have nothing to do with each other. Separated them completely. Now, Descartes was a guy that loved clocks and mechanical toys. And he basically used that idea and said, well, the world of the physical, material things, that's just like a clock, you know? It's a mechanical toy. We just have to figure out how it works, and that's it, you know? It's, it, that's the nature of it. Okay. Now, there was another guy famous in philosophy called, this is where the philosophers really, you know, still had influence, Francis Bacon, who then said, ah, but if the physical world is just a dead object, we can torture it to get its secrets and then we will control it. This is where the, basically that's the guy who came up with the sentence, knowledge is power. Knowledge is power actually means we dominate the physical and can do with it what we want. Because it's worthless. That's the idea. You can see me going to sustainability at some point, I suppose. Okay. Now, Newton, another famous guy, he was influenced by these people. 
And he came up with the new physics. Well, in those days, it was the new physics. So he translated this mechanistical view of the world, of nature, and he basically made it explicit in his understanding of what science was supposed to be. So, and here are some things which are still very predominant in our thinking, okay? and which I will argue is a major underlying mental cause of unsustainability. And I'll link this to results-based management at some point. <laughs> so bear with me, okay? So what he says is basically, well, space is an empty stage. There's nothing in space except objects, eh? but you know, in between the objects, there's nothingness, eh? it's emptiness. And he talked about causal laws of nature, where basically this is about understanding the initial conditions, the laws that govern what happens to objects, gravity, that type of thing, and then we can fully predict what's going to happen. This is determinism, He's basically saying everything is determined already in advance. There are laws that govern everything, atoms, basically how, what will happen, that's all being predetermined. That's an, an idea of causality, huh? an idea of causality as something that is basically situated in time and space. Huh? It's separated by time and space. This idea of separation is quite important when we are starting to think about sustainability. So, oh. Another element of the scientific paradigm that Newton launched is the only thing that is real is something that we can measure with our five senses. What we also need to do is ban all emotions and subjectiveness to have a fully rational and objective scientific inquiry. That's also important. Now that view of science was afterwards picked up in all the disciplines. So it wasn't just physics. Everybody started, they started to expand, of course, the realm of science to other things than physics, and they all used the same paradigm. It's always the same thing behind it. Now, these words, control, causal laws, prediction, measurement, objectiveness, rationality, does that sound familiar? Remember when I showed you some of the elements of results-based management and the thinking we've looked at until now? It's firmly rooted in this type of thinking. It's a Newtonian way of thinking about causality. It's a Newtonian way of thinking about reality. That's basically a view from physics translated into the realm of the social. Because when we're doing results-based management, this is a social business. Eh? This is dealing with people. So, keeping it purposeful and lean, actually, as the accountability concept behind results-based management, that's founded on this Newtonian scientific view. So it's very closely linked to each other. If you look back to the slides I showed on uh, lean and purposeful, these are, you know, things you find there. Obviously, you find them again in new public management, Obviously, you find them again in, in uh, results-based management because they're all coming from the same source, the same view of thinking about accountability as lean and purposeful. Behind that view is, I'm arguing, Bacon and Newton. Everybody still with me? Okay. Now, this is how things are going on today. So, probably familiar with this uh, picture. That's uh, coming out of uh, Peter Senge's book also, which I think you're probably familiar with, uh, showing basically that, well, things are not going so well at the moment. We're uh, having some uh, problems. Uh, this is our production chain, but this is creating all sorts of problems and pressures in other systems. Uh, We've got a production system, that's nice, but we've got all sorts of other systems. We've got ecological systems and social systems that are being affected by what's happening in the economic system. Now, of course, if you're a Newtonian, everything is separated by time and space. What this means for an economic system is, if we have waste, we just put it in a developing country, that's far away, and if we have problems, we shove them over to the next generation, that's distant in time. And that's solved, thing, problem solved. And this is a Newtonian way of thinking about problems in reality, eh? also sustainable development problems. Eh? It's shifting the burden somewhere else or to the future. Because people say, well, that's distant, right? It's like planets, you know, it's not that much difference. So that's an idea of causality, which cuts up reality 
and says, well, it's all distant in time and space. We do not need to worry about it if it's not in our backyard today. So this is Peter Singer again with a nice quote, I think, where he says, if we see each problem, be it water shortages, climate change, or poverty as separate and approach each separately, the solutions we come up will be short-term, often opportunistic, quick fixes that do nothing to address the deeper imbalances. Because the real world is a complex world where lots of things are interlinked. Trying to deal with that world with a Newtonian mindset, which in the end is results-based management, that might be a problem. This is the reason. That's another smart guy, Albert Einstein, saying we cannot solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. So we basically might need some else, something else, a different way of thinking. And the different way of thinking that is basically going very much against the Newtonian mindset is the new theories of complexity, which we actually haven't talked about yet up until now. So let me explain a little bit about complexity. Yeah. And now we'll get to the Newton, uh, well, we already had the Newton stuff. Now we're going to the quantum mechanics. This is what people assume when they deploy an intervention in the social systems that we are working with in terms of uh, development, or in the ecological yeah. systems even. Yeah. So if you're a results-based management person, this is your idea. That's basically linear thinking. Whether it's complicated or simple doesn't matter that much. If it's complicated, we just have more strands, but it's all the same cause-effect thinking. Uh, it's all the same idea behind it, the same Newtonian way of thinking about cause and effect. So that doesn't really matter, that distinction between simple and complicated. You know, complicated is just a more complicated version of simple. Uh, but sometimes stuff happens like this. Sorry. We have a plan. We start with the plan very quickly. Bye-bye plan. We start with something else. Ooh, it's just one big mess. All stuff gets, sorts of stuff get tried. Some of it works, some of it doesn't. It's a bit of a, bit of a mess. In the end, we still know where we want to go, broadly speaking. Not in terms of smart objectives, but broadly speaking, we have a vision of what we would like to see in, in the future, where we want to go. It's not so clearly defined as the people in results-based management often want us to define it with indicators and all that type of stuff. Now, people will say, yes, yes, but you know, that's not really very different. Because in the end, we can say that what you should have done is focus everything on this. That's the right path. You just were inefficient, not lean and purposeful, by doing all these other things. You're just not bad managers. Well, I'm going to argue that this is not true, that you cannot, in complex situations, like most social systems are, when you're dealing with social systems, you cannot in advance determine what the best possible path will be. It's impossible. You can afterwards say, well, it would have been nice if we'd known in advance that that was the shortest way to get there, but that doesn't mean you can say it in advance. That's a big distinction. So, don't be confused by that. It's not because we can trace a causal chain that worked best to achieve a vision afterwards that we can actually predefine it. Some things are just uncertain. Some things will just have to emerge as you go along. And then you have to grab the opportunity when you see it. And then, you know, all sorts of things happen. In the end, hopefully, some of them leading to where you want to go. Now, for the people from the private sector, Minsberg, basically, a famous author again, you know, one of those icons, a little bit like Drucker, basically had the same idea when he talked about strategy. And he said, well, there is something called planned strategy. Well, then there's part of the plan, which you see slightly less <laughs> that we actually execute. That's deliberate strategy. Then there's a lot that we don't do. Then there's stuff that comes up that we exploit. That's what we call emergent strategy. And then in the end, we've got realized strategy. That's basically the sum of deliberate and emergent strategy. So these are all the things you cannot know in advance that are going to come up that you'll just have to see and be aware of. That means you keep your eyes open. If you're an automatic pilot, well, this will be what you do and nothing here. Yeah. So you have to keep your eyes open, obviously. He also says, when, if we only find deliberate strategy, basically we're not learning. 
You were an automatic pilot. No learning there. If you only got emerging strategy, that's not good either. That means people are maybe doing just whatever. So there has to be a combination of both. There has to be some deliberate strategy, and you have to keep your eyes open to make sure that you can uh, exploit opportunities coming up out of the environment, which is changing all the time. So it's normal that stuff comes up that you cannot foresee. If you could foresee it, you'd have planned for it, right? So it's just not possible. People in strategic management have known that for a while. Right? People in resource-based management haven't figured that out yet. So uh, that's Minsberg on strategy. Now, is this resource-based management on strategy? Let's just measure some stuff. Now, this is reality. Huh? So in my business, uh, lots of people submit logical frameworks with indicators to monitor. And it's three-year programs or three-year projects, complicated, well, complex stuff, you know, trying to have some real social change affecting systems. It's all neatly planned out to get proofed with a logical framework, of course. And then they report on it, on the indicators. And then you talk to people, like in NGOs, and say, well, you know, indicators is all very, very nice. You know, we don't know anyway how high the target should be. So they report on it, and we say, well, that's not really hitting the target. Or it's uh, maybe higher than the target, like 1,000%. Uh, that type of stuff happens. OK, thank you for the data. Interesting. Now we know what's happening, right? OK, nobody acts on that, of course. What does it mean? It doesn't really mean that much. This is what's really going on. You know, they're really managing in the real world, and it's complex. They're dealing with you know, 15 drunken mon monkeys with a jigsaw puzzle, trying to put it together. Uh, but what we want to hear is the simple version in the logic model. Eh? And then we say, yes, that's fine. At the end, targets not met or targets superseded with a crazy amount, right? which is just as crazy, of course. Right? People 50% below target or 1,000% above target. You should question what the value is of things like that. And we have no idea what really went on. So lots of people in NGOs, when I ask them how they deal with the requirements that major funders like World Bank and European Commission uh, impose on them when they do complex projects is they say, well, you know, we have two management systems. We have the paper bullshit for the commission, and then we have the real world where we manage. And I would say it's probably a good idea to rethink the system uh, if you're at the European Commission, because I would not like to find this out, right, that I have no idea about this, because I'm watching some meaningless numbers. That's in the complex. Eh? Don't take me wrong. When you're doing vaccinations, that's a different business. Eh? They're counting how many people are vaccinated and how many people fall in. That's really useful. This is a different business. We're now in the world of the complex. Let me explain a little bit more what the difference is between these different concepts. So we've got the simple. You already saw it a little bit, the vaccine stuff. Well, here's another example of that. It's like baking a cake or making bread. You know, a recipe is essential. Follow the recipe or it will probably not taste so good if you Say, let's improvise, and I put just one ton of salt in it. Mm, you know, probably not a good idea. Right? Somebody figured out what the cake should be like. Of course, they figured it out because they tested it. They tried it, and then when they stabilized it, this is the good way to do, make a cake. Once the recipe is there, basically everybody can make a cake, right? Well, maybe I can't, but, you know. So... Um, it basically produces these standardized project, products. Eh? So think about vaccination. Somebody came up with what should be in the vaccine, how to administer it, and please do it like that and not differently, eh? or it will not taste well. So you're pretty sure of the same results every time. Now, let's think about something like a rocket to the moon. That's slightly more complicated, right, than baking a cake. Here, not everybody can build a rocket, I'm afraid. So. Uh, that's we basically work for experts. Uh, experts bringing together different kinds of expertise, you know, electrical wiring, uh, aerodynamics, whatever. It's too much for one brain to hold, so they have to work closely together and integrate it all. Uh, it's the realm of expertise. Now, they do have formula, 
but this is not exactly the same as a recipe, which is the one way of doing things. There are different ways of doing things, different ways of building a rocket that, you know, it all works, they'll all fly. You know, the Russians built them differently than the Europeans. Uh, sometimes they explode, of course. There is only a high degree of certainty of outcome. Uh, some people can get it wrong anyway, sometimes. But basically, it's more complicated, more expertise having to be put together, different elements. You cannot leave this up to somebody reading a manual saying, I'll put a rocket together now. Uh, now we get to the complex, which this is sort of more of a, let's say, an evolution. And now we are having a revolution where, you know, raising a child. Well, most of you don't have kids yet, maybe here. You guys have kids. Uh, or maybe you have some nephews and small nieces or whatever. Uh, if you've seen, uh, uh, seen a few kids around, then uh, you understand that when you raise a kid, there is no recipe. There is no manual. What works with one doesn't work with the other one. Actually, what works with one doesn't work with that kid two hours later anymore either. <laughs> So, we have some principles of good parenting. It's a very short manual, <laughs> but no detailed instructions. If the kid does this, do that, and then it will be fine. You know? It's basically, you try some stuff, you think like, mm, maybe positive feedback helps now. You try it, doesn't work, then you put them in the corner. Okay, so that's basically a really different world. That's a world of emergence where you have to see what's, what's happening. You do something, you watch, and you react again. That's a very different uh, uh, way of thinking. So keep that in mind a little bit. So we, up until now, we haven't really talked about this. This is the realm of social systems. This is something different than what I've talked about before. Try to explain that a little bit more. I'm using... Uh, framework by a guy called Dave Snowden who used to run um, IBM's knowledge management activities. And he basically divides reality into four components. We haven't talked about chaos yet, that also exists. And basically a lot of the things we've talked about I'm going to repeat now. In the simple we have cause and effect relations that are repeatable and almost instant. That means whatever you do you see the effect very quickly. No long waiting for it. Uh, it happens reasonably fast. Uh, like with vaccinations, you vaccine somebody, the flu epidemic arrives, you know, within a couple of months, you know. It's not that distant. This is what we call the realm of the known knowns. <laughs> People that have watched uh, the war in Iraq might be familiar with this terminology. It used, was used by a former uh, Secretary of State, I think, or Minister of, what was it? Rumsfeld. It's Rumsfeld, huh? yeah. Okay, so basically, we know what we know in this. This is like looking at a bicycle or a cake. It's clear, you know, what's in it, how it works. Don't need a lot of expertise for that. Everybody can see it. With the complicated, it becomes more complicated, of course. Cause and effect become more separated over time and space, but they are analyzable and repeatable. That's like the rocket, you know. You put the rocket together, it takes a long time to put it together. Okay, then you launch it, and then it hopefully works and it will work again if you do the rocket in the same way. That's what we call the realm of the known unknowns, is stuff we can find out. It's not immediately obvious. That's why we have to run lots of diagnostics before we launch a rocket into space, because you can't just look at the rocket and say, yeah, looks okay, it's going to fly. I think they did that once and then it exploded. That's the known unknowns. You know what you don't know and then you can find out by analysis, by research, information gathering. The complex, that's a little bit more complex. <laughs> there we are dealing with unknown unknowns. It's basically, we don't know what we don't know. So you cannot find out because you don't know what to find out. You will have to see what happens. Things will emerge. That means cause and effect is basically only coherent in retrospect. You cannot determine in advance. Then chaos, well, there cause and effect is not even perceivable in retrospect. It's just pure chaos. That's the realm of the unknowable. And that's still different. There's nothing to be known there. It's just chaos. Now, this is the area where resource-based management 
in the traditional way is actually appropriate. Newtonian way of thinking. This is where we need quantum mechanics way of thinking. Uh, so different, a very, I use this as a metaphor to basically de demonstrate how different the thinking has to be. Uh, so there's a really big thing difference between Newton physics and quantum mechanics. Uh, it's such a big divide between the two. Well, it's a little bit the same here. Uh, to be able to deal with complex and chaos, that's so different. Yes, but I started late, didn't I? <laughs> I'm just being warned that I don't have that much time yet, but I started 15 minutes late, so. Okay, there's also disorder that just means we don't even know which condition we are in. Uh, that's something different also. So, almost there on the quantum mechanics part, right? If we're talking about people, that's also different in the simple, the complicated, and the complex and the chaotic. In the simple world, we have very strong central coordination and control, power. This is the world of best practice, of things which are obvious to all. You should do it like that and not differently. Vaccine people in a specific way and not differently. Don't start putting it in their heads or something. You know, if it's supposed to be in their arm. The complicated domain of the experts and of good practice because there are different ways of doing things well. Different ways of building a rocket that flies, not just one way. If we're in the complex, we're in the realm of the informal networks. That basically means that top-down control and authority, that breaks down. And what we have are informal networks between people. That's the realm of where a lot of the informal networks are situated and have their effect and deal with things like emergence and deal with the unexpected. And then, oh, oh, I went too fast. Finally, we're in the chaotic where basically, you know, no patterns are forming. It's really not even possible to figure out what's happening. So you see there are different ways that, uh, so here, this connection also between people at the bottom, there's just no connections anymore. Here, this is the strongest connections. This is the reason why expert systems are rigid. It's very hard once experts get their hands on something and have found out how to do things, like a log frames, <laughs> to actually break that. This is a discussion I recently had in the commission with experts. Of course, experts contracted by European Commission to do log frames and PCM. And you know, there's just only one answer. <laughs> That's uh, basically, yes, but we do that with PCM. Yes, but we do that with PCM. It's just that people don't use it right. It's just that people don't have the capacity to use it. It's all sorts of reasons why PCM doesn't work in complex situations. It's just, you know, the people are not flexible, the people are not smart enough, blah, blah, blah. Nobody actually dares to say, well, maybe the system is inappropriate for complex situations. Maybe it's a little bit crazy to ask people to plan three-year projects in advance when they're trying to deal with a complex social system. You know, might be useful to have them plan the three first months and to have a vision of where they want to go into the end and have them report regularly back and see how it's going, what new decisions they are taking based on their capacity to adapt to emerging information, but not to plan everything for three years and then say they're not flexible enough to change the plan, you know, which of course you can't do just like that because it's a contract and you have to get approval from the commission as if they're flexible, right? Okay. So that's behind it. Some ways of imagining this again, giving the flu shot. So simple situations is very much like standing on the, on the, how do you call that, the production line. A brain operation, that's a little bit more complicated, but this is the realm, essentially, of the known unknowns. People have a pretty good manual how to surge, you know, do brain surgery, thank God. They're not improvising all the time, so they know what to do when stuff happens, when there is a bleed, you know, is there somebody there, an expert in stopping bleeding and does the stuff. Yeah. Thank God. Of course, sometimes something happens that's unexpected and they don't know how to deal with it. Well, then they're in the complex and then you'll see you, the really good doctors. But also something like reorganization of a hospital. That's a complex situation. Lots of stuff happening there. People reacting to whatever you do. Just one person can mess up the whole thing and you have to rethink completely how you're dealing with things. But that doesn't mean it's completely chaotic. That's like fish swimming together. It looks like chaos, 
what is actually ordered. It's just not possible to say what the order is. That's different. Nobody can say, well, you know, well, what's the system here? You cannot put it into a causal scheme. You cannot put it into a theory of change. That's a Newtonian way of thinking. Newton, fine for this stuff. Problem here. Well, chaos, that's like SARS when it just happened. I'm in the medical field now, you see. I try to keep my examples a little bit <laughs> consistent. Uh, SARS when it just happens, chaos. Nobody has any clue what's going on. And it's pure chaos. No causality that you can perceive there. In the afternoon, I'll be talking about ways to deal with all of these uh, strategies to do that. This is just a list of things. What is really a complex system? I'll go, because I have to watch my time a little bit. I think you understand the idea of a complex system. Uh, you can watch that again afterwards. What, in theories of change terminology, this means is that we're not sure what to do. The intervention is a cloud. We have some ideas, stuff to start, not a clear idea of everything we should do for the next three years. We have no clear, smart, short-term outcomes. You know, measurable, it's not there. Even the long-term outcomes, we don't have them in a smart way. We do have a vision, usually. You know, an idea, a concept of where we would like to move to from today to you know, maybe into three years, a change in the system. But we don't really have it all nailed down in the specifics that are required by something like results-based management. Now, some people have tried to figure a solution for that. I said, well, you know, but you, we need a theory of change because, you know, everybody likes their theory of change now. Huh? Uh, that's the new evolution, right? I could have stopped there because that's pretty new, actually, yeah, theory of change. So people are into that now, and they try to theory of change everything. Now, that's a problem, though, with emergent situations because you cannot lay out the causality like I did earlier with the example of the World Bank. You're basically admitting that, well, you don't know what's going to happen next. You're not sure. You might be, have an idea of, about the immediate future, but not beyond that. So what some people do is say, well, we have emergent theories of change. They're basically like a framework in which you're saying that I don't know what's going to happen. First, we get people to, to participate in something. Then there will be greater awareness of these participants. And then all sorts of stuff will happen that we don't know what it is yet. Some people will hopefully identify some existing opportunities. We don't know which ones. That will emerge. We'll see. Some people will apply these opportunities, will, will have opportunities to apply capacity that they've acquired. It's, it's basically just saying we don't know that much. We think there's going to be a certain kind of dynamic, but we don't know the specifics of it. And that's one way of trying to deal with the fact that basically it's a little bit in the clouds, so we can't pin it down, not the way I did nicely with the example of the teachers, uh, where, if you think about it, you might ask yourself if that is actually uh, not a complex situation. And basically, you're kidding yourself trying to map it out the way it was done there. So some people have written about this and say, well, this whole realm of the complex is really ch stretching the application of theories of change to a point where it becomes both methodologically and theoretically fragile. So I'm not the only one saying that. <laughs> There's other people questioning whether theories of change actually still work in the complex situations. And some people have advocated also to move towards principles of change, just to have principles, like with raising kids, right? There is no map with cause and effect chains for raising kids, but there are principles. There are some things that people say, that is good stuff to try and see what happens. Okay. So that's an idea. It's not an idea that is totally new. In business, there is also a line of thinking, like people like uh, uh, Eisenhardt, who is a professor of strategy and organization at Stanford University, not a bad university, in the US. And they thought about it like that in strategic management also. And they're saying basically in highly dynamic environments, like the complex, strategy as simple rules might be better than strategy as positioning, which is the porter type of thing. You know, should we differentiate? Should we be a low-cost provider, that type of thing? 
and is better than the resource-based view of strategy also. They're saying we just need simple rules. And to give you an idea what they are, so that's already uh, stuff that's, that's a, a little bit older, um, they came up with all sorts of different kinds of rules. How-to rules, boundary rules, priority rules, timing rules, exit rules. This is all to help people adapt quickly and play into opportunities quickly. Because basically saying it's unplannable, we need to be able to capture what we can do at the moment when we need to do it. This is where the whole stuff of emergent strategy like uh, Minsberg, says it, this is apl applicable to that. Uh, in emergent strategy, if that's a really big part of your strategy because it's, the, the, the dynamics are changing all the time, the environment is changing all the time, well, you need some rules to help you through that. And there has been research in strategic management to demonstrate that this is why some companies have thrived and others have perished. So, all the references are in the back. You can have a look at these things. I need to start moving quickly. Okay, so up until now, I've presented this as being something like or, or. It's simple, or it's complicated, or it's complex. Well, it's getting worse because in many situations, we have all these uh, components. So if you're running a program, there might be parts that are simple, there might be parts that are complicated, and there are parts that are complex. Uh, it usually has to do with the reach of the program. The more you start to think about these long-term objectives and visions, the more complex it becomes. The more you're dealing with present things, sometimes there are components there that are just simple, and you can just use that type of thinking there. Sometimes it's complicated, sometimes it requires complex thinking. So uh, you see some exam an example here uh, where in a teacher, in an education project again, uh, some parts of what the teachers do in the project are simple, some are complicated, some are complex. So accountability in the complex, that's a good question. Well, I thought I had a nice little uh, cartoon here, okay, probably comes afterwards. So what is the problem here with the accountability as determined by the Newtonian concept which is behind lean and purposeful. So we're having some problems here now. Because outcomes cannot be pre-identified but will emerge. So forget about RCTs. How can you do an RCT where you are required to measure at the beginning and at the end if the outcome is not certain? You're not even sure what you would want to measure. You're not sure what you're aiming for. Not in that type of specific measurable way. We just have a broad vision of the future where we would like to move to. Trying to nail that down into uh, indicators that will work for the next three years is probably a bad idea in the complex. It's making the system rigid. Causality is not linear in the complex. It's recursive. That means there's lots of feedback loops. There's also an initial action can have a major out of proportion effect. If you just hit a right button and all of a sudden something great happens. Right? So it's not proportional. So that's basically a problem with this concept. Now they're leaving. Now we get to the quantum mechanics bit, finally. <laughs> so we're almost done. I had a nice slide here. Oh, it's weird. Oh. OK, so I'm using this to, as a metaphor to help you understand that you really need a big change in thinking, a change that I think is almost as big when people had to change from Newton to quantum physics. OK, so let's have a comparison here in terms of the idea of causality under Newtonian physics. Events happen in time and space. Matter is fixed, containing atoms that move just like a larger object. So in the small, it's basically electrons fly around uh, atoms like planets fly around the sun. Uh, that's the idea of Newtonian physics. It's the same causal laws. It's all the same. The system in Newtonian physics is the sum of its parts. It's not greater than its parts. In the quantum world, it's a slightly different reality. Uh, for people who have been raised like I have in school with Newtonian physics, I didn't get quantum physics when I was in high school. Well, it's very different. There is no empty space in quantum physics. Emptiness doesn't exist. It's an energy field. Actually, objects and atoms emerge from this energy field from time to time. Uh, so. That means everything is connected to everything. There is no emptiness, no time even. It's superseding time and 
emptiness. Uh, so that's basically radically different from Newton. Uh, it's totally the reverse, you could say. Well, you could say that in the complex, when you think about the complex, there are some similarities we can draw, which means it's an equally large jump in thinking. In system dynamics, everything is also connected to everything. You saw my little Peter Senge drawing with the production system, ecosystem, social systems. It's all connected to everything. So we cannot catch this in a linear way. We cannot model this in a linear way. That's not possible. We can only catch some principles, some patterns that emerge. We call that in uh, complexity attractors, uh, things that actually might make a difference, might uh, change the system and the way it behaves. The system in the complex is greater than its parts. So it's not just an addition of things in the system. The way that works actually generates something greater than its parts. That's one element. Then we have these other things, universal laws, Determinism, we can predict things. Well, in the quantum world, actually, reality is inherently unpredictable. So there is randomness in reality. It's not a question of just knowing the laws. Actually, you could say the law is that there is unpredictability at the quantum level. Uh, this is demonstrated when, for example, electrons jump from orbits. Nobody can predict where they are going to jump to. This is actually fundamentally unpredictable. There is no law for that. It's randomness, basically, below that. So this deterministic idea is not really correct. In the complex, we also forget about prediction. That's a simple statement. You cannot predict in the complex. OK, final element, Newton. What is real is what is measurable with our five senses. Get rid of emotions and subjectivity. We're fully rational objectivity in terms of scientific inquiry and planning. Now in the quantum, also that Newtonian concept is questioned, well shown to be incorrect at the quantum level at least. For example, photons and electrons are particles that have no location. They're basically waves. So they're a field of probability. A field of probability that sometimes collapses into a particle that then has a location. Now, guess what actually makes this collapse happen? It's observation. So if there is no observation, the probability field does not collapse. I know this is a little bit complicated, but uh, the idea here is basically that observation is what determines reality. That's quantum physics. Now, if we draw a parallel to the complex, again, making a big jump, eh? just a jump like from here to here is like a jump from there to there, is that basically, Researchers, they influence when they research. So forget about this sort of, oh, I'm a researcher and I'm just, you know, completely objective and rational, just looking at reality the way it is. Acting in the system as a researcher actually changes the system, might change the dynamics. And also, visioning, that's actually key in bringing about a new reality. So when I talked about we have a vision, that's really important when dealing with the complex. If you have no vision, Okay, then basically you are just uh, in chaos. You're not getting out of chaos even. So you need to have a direction, but it's not the type of thing which you can plan out, map out, and say, well, this is predictable. This is the way it's going to happen. It's fundamentally not like that. It's fundamentally an emergent reality where you have to see what's going to happen based on what you, th you did and then react to that. Now. I'm not killing Newtonian physics altogether here with my presentation. That's not my intention. They're pretty, pretty good still when you look at some parts of reality, the simple and the complicated issues. That type of thinking is still appropriate. Just like Newtonian thinking is pretty good still to predict the orbits of the planets. But it's not always right. This is the reason why people invented quantum physics in the first place, is because of the errors that they found when they applied Newtonian physics to the orbits of the planets. There were deviations from what was predicted that they could not explain. And that's basically the, the birth of quantum physics. Came out of that. It's the same with the complex. Because we see that the way we deal with the reality sometimes doesn't work well. Huh? We understand that this is when we deal with the complex. We basically need to change our way of thinking there. Now, I think it's a big problem that in the Western way of thinking, the Western world, Newtonian thinking is a 
mental model. Right? We're all being educated with that. At least my generation, the ones in power at the moment, maybe you guys are going to be able to fix the problem, but uh, my generation has been really seriously embedded still in Newtonian thinking, and that's a problem. They're the ones calling the shots right now, and that's not good enough to deal with the complex. So that's a problem. Hang on, we're almost there. I'll be on time, you see, but you know, we started 15 minutes late. Uh, okay, ah, here's my cartoon. This is basically a, a depiction of what's a danger at the moment also, is the people that find complexity really interesting, not me of course, but other people, <laughs> um, are using it as an excuse to also kill off the concept of accountability altogether and say, well, you know, it's all so complex and uh, there's no time for accountability, it's not possible to be accountable. That's a danger, I think it's not the right way of thinking. Huh? I think we have to think differently about accountability, but it's still relevant. But the old ways of thinking about it are not good enough anymore, especially the lean and purposeful way of thinking about accountability, the way it's connected to the current results-based management paradigm. That doesn't work well on the complex, that's clear. But that doesn't mean there is no s accountability. OK. So I have to make a distinction here between two approaches towards accountability. This is a different thing than the three types of accountability. These are approaches. What do you do with those types of accountability? There's the compliance-based approach. That basically says, follow the rules. Don't think. Public procurement rules. That's connected to understand fair. Just think. You know, obviously, we all know that sometimes we get just the companies that are best at writing proposals and they're crap. But OK, the rules are the rules, so you know, I'm covered. On paper, they're the best. I know it's going to be awful, but on paper, they're the best. Safety regulations, OK. Might be a good idea to follow them. Sometimes people get killed if they don't think about it. But you know. And then the more recent way of thinking about compliance is meeting the numbers or the targets. So we've got the, the three different types of accountability here and how you could deal with them or how many people deal with them. It's a compliance-based approach. It's a tick-boxing-based approach. Yeah, did that, did that, did that, did the targets. They're completely useless targets, you know, not relevant anymore. Eh? Think about the previous one. But, pff, well, we did it. Yeah. Okay, another way to think about this is the principle-based approach. That's broadly doing the right thing. That means this is you thinking. This is going back to Drucker, to management by objectives, where this was not to, supposed to be compliance-oriented. So it's not a question of control. This was a question of focus, of orientation, of thinking about things, adapting, learning. Well, so that's more in, in line with this. So it's being trustworthy, true to the mandate. You demonstrate learning and responsibility. That means you're accountable for demonstrating this. You're not accountable for hitting the number. You're accountable for being able to explain how you did it, why you did it, what happened. Was it sensible? Did you think? So forget the number. We get the target in the complex. Eh? Never mistaken that in the complicated and the simple, the rules are still can be different. Eh? There, in the simple, I'd like everybody to be compliant, honestly. <laughs> and not to be uh, improvising and saying, I think I've got a good idea how to give vaccination differently. Let's just mess with the dose and I put some sugar in it. And let's see what happens. And it merges. Yeah, OK. That's not the idea. Yeah. Doing the best possible job given the circumstances, resources, and constraints. That's robustness, addressing the overall need or rationale for why a policy program or project is in place. This is vision thinking. This is purposefulness. So the three different ways of thinking about accountability are back here. But I can, you feel there is a twist to them. It's a little bit different. Now, what does this mean, for example? We have some examples where compliance-based approach conflicts with principle-based approach in my line of business. I encounter this a lot. For example, it's not responsible for a program or a project to do exactly what it's set out to do when everybody understands that it actually doesn't make any sense anymore. And they still do it because there's a contract and people get paid on this and blah, blah, blah. Actually, that conflicts then 
with accountability as robust and resilient. They're not adapting. They're not actually making the changes that are necessary because they plan the linear cause-effect uh, project. Because they're Newtonians. <laughs> they think everything is determined. And then when they see it isn't, they choose not to see it. It's not responsible either to restrict ourselves to simple interventions. That's also a problem happening right now. It's because it's easy and fits within the paradigm of Newtonian thinking to actually do simple interventions. And people say, you know, we understand there is complexity. Let's stay away from it. Well, that's not responsible. There's actually conflicts with being honest and fair, with a more balanced approach. It's basically giving all the attention to uh, lean and purposeful in a correct way. Fine, you know, you're in the simple, give lots of vaccinations, because that is controllable, that is predictable, you can do RCTs on that, it's all fine. But then choosing not to do anything else anymore because you cannot apply one paradigm, that I find not responsible. Okay, oops. Oh. Ah. Now, so I'm not killing off Newtonian thinking. I'm not killing off uh, compliance thinking. It's actually quite appropriate when we deal with simple situations. Best practice is best practice. Please do the best practice. Same with experts handling complicated situations like people flying a plane, I'd rather not have them see the plane as some sort of emergent project where they're going to figure out what to do once they start flying around and say, oh, let's go there and see what happens when we go into the storm cloud, when the manual tells you to avoid the storm cloud. Huh? So that's probably not a good idea here. So here, good practice, that's a good idea, follow it. It's compliance thinking. That's fine in those realms. It's a problem when you hit the complex. Then you have to switch to the principled approach. If you stay on a compliant route, actually what you're doing is you're being irresponsible and not accountable. So you have to switch your idea of accountability to be truly accountable in the complex. And that principle approach is clearly more in line with the quantum way of thinking. Huh? So. Where we can actually deal with the three different types of accountability because they're all there. Huh? So we deal with it by being a, having a principled approach. So that sometimes that might mean let's be less lean and purposeful. Let's have some more redundancy. You know, we have to be able to explain it. We have to say this is a responsible decision to have a backup system, even though this is not the most efficient. That's what happened in Japan with the nuclear facility. Oh, no need to put up walls for a tsunami because it's not efficient, you know, because that doesn't happen, right? Well, it happened. Okay, I'm going to skip this part about the chaotic environment just to say uh, very quickly that if you're in chaos, get out of it. <laughs> so I'll talk about that in the afternoon a little bit more. Uh, so in the, in, in the chaotic, basically, the, the idea is get out of the chaotic and move to the complex as quickly as possible. So some take-home points. I think uh, that's my conclusion, basically. So I'm right on time with that. <laughs> um, is basically RBM and logic models and theories of change is, leaned, is linked to the lean and purposeful concept of accountability. Sustainable development is linked to all three values of accountability. So it's not enough. So what should we do? We should push for demonstrating accountability for being responsible because that can handle the three different ways of thinking when we are in the complex, which is a big part of reality, the complex. So we can't just pretend it's not there. And we also don't want to be trapped into simple logic, which is something, you know, another way of dealing with it is saying, well, we recognize the complex, but we stay away from it. Well, that's not something we want to do either. Okay, in the end, if we're dealing with the complex in terms of methodologies and strategies of dealing with that, we can't do attribution, we can't do contribution. Those concepts don't really work in the complex. So we need something else. We need basically to have a compelling vision. That's a starting point. So if people don't have that, well, they should be supported in creating it. We can use emergent theories or principle-based theories of change as starting points for then participative, rapid cycling, real-time feedback methods. That means stuff is coming up. We need to be aware of it. We need to be able to quickly think on our feet what to do about it and take the next steps forward. And demonstrate in that way 
from a principle-based approach of accountability, that we are being responsible. Not by sitting there and saying, oh yeah, you know, lots of stuff happening, but I'm just sticking to the plan. Let's just go and be compliant. If you think about it, and you look back at Peter Senge's work on sustainable development, what he's saying is there are three necessary capacities if we want to move forward, if we want to have a more sustainable world. And he's saying you need to see, see systems. That's about dealing with the complex. Seeing system is a competence of seeing the complex for what it is. You need to collaborate across boundaries. That's participative. That's basically getting the system in the room. If you have everybody involved in the system in the room, then you have a, a not clear and specific and measurable meta, um, uh, database about what's going on in the system. Right? It's not a question of being able to then draw it out and map it and put it, in, put it in a theory of change, but actually the way that the dynamics then work reflects the dynamics of the system and you can uh, move forward. And then the vision part is of course where he says you should create desired futures and that's a competence that we have to learn. So I'm signing off with Peter Senge, who I started with, just to make an introduction towards the afternoon, is that uh, where I will be talking about balanced scorecards and the way balanced scorecard thinking can deal with a lot of the complex. And I'm not the only one thinking that. This is uh, from a recent publication from the Overseas Development Institute, Harry Jones, who's their complexity theorist guy, um, who's basically saying something like, we need to move to principle-based approach of accountability, and one way of doing that might be using balanced scorecard thinking. So that's for another presentation this afternoon. I'm done for now. Okay, Oof. that's that's it. <laughs> References are there also for everybody. Thank you.